Welcome, everyone. Uh, today is March 11th, 2020. Uh, I'm Terry Hildebrandt, the Director of Evidence-Based Coaching at the Fielding Graduate University. And today we have an Evidence-Based Coaching Thought Leaders webinar. We're really pleased to have Dr. Jim Knickerbocker and Charles Jones with us. They're going to be talking about a new approach to coaching clients and emotional intelligence. And it's known as the Tenor Method. And uh, it's a method I've personally been using I was trained by Charles and Jim a number of years ago, and I found it to be an incredibly breakthrough approach, uh, something you probably have never heard before. So I'm very excited to be able to bring this to the fielding community and beyond. Uh, and I would like uh, Jim and Charles to go ahead and introduce themselves briefly. Then I'm going to turn it over to them. Uh, later in the webinar, you will have a chance to ask questions, but we would like you to hold your questions or go ahead and put them in the group chat so we know uh, and have your questions uh, handy when we get uh, to the part in the webinar where we uh, have an open dialogue. So uh, Jim and Charles, welcome, and I'm gonna turn it over to you. Great, thank you. Charles, did you wanna introduce yourself first and I'll introduce myself and then Sure. So my name is Charles Jones, and I'm the chief scientist with the Institute for Adaptive Mastery. And I've been uh, working on the underlying theory that will be presented here today since 1982, and then have been collaborating for six years now with uh, closely with Jim to develop it into a coaching methodology. Thanks. I'm Dr. Jim Knickerbocker. I'm a. a I got my uh, doctorate in uh, human organizational development from Fielding. So it's lovely to be back amongst uh, the Fielding crowd once again. And uh, I'm an executive coach, and uh, I also work closely with Charles to develop and disseminate uh, the tenor method. I'm the chief trainer uh, of, of the uh, tenor method as well. So uh, I think with that, Charles will um, start us off, and then uh, I will uh, pick up about halfway through. Terrific. So um, today I'm going to be leading off by discussing um, kind of the growing importance of emotional intelligence and then point out some areas where current approaches to developing emotional intelligence fall short of what's really needed. Uh, I'll then present a new theory of emotion and uh, this new theory um, addresses uh, what we found in coaching clients is that a lot of the clients have ideas about emotion that actually get in the way of them developing their emotional intelligence. So I'm going to um, contrast those common sense or typical client uh, ideas about emotions with uh, a new theory of emotion. And then I'm going to turn the presentation over to Jim, who's going to walk you through tenor. That's our five step methodology for increasing emotional intelligence that's based on this new theory of emotion. Assuming we stay on track about half an hour from now, we're gonna open it to uh, questions and answers, have a, a discussion, and then we'll conclude by offering you a list of resources on how you can learn more. So the emotional intelligence and coaching, the good news is clients are much more aware of emotional intelligence and there's multiple assessments to measure it. The bad news is that the current approaches aren't enough in our experience to eliminate reactive behavior or to support rational decision making. And the you know, good, bad, ugly paradigm here, clients have ingrained beliefs about emotions that impede emotional intelligence. I'm now gonna walk you through three of those beliefs. Their beliefs about what causes emotions, their beliefs about what causes reactive behavior, and what they see as the relationship between emotions and rational decision making. So what causes emotions? Um, the typical client belief is that emotions are uh, inevitable reactions to what's happening in the world. Um, had a client who was very frustrated with a coworker when I asked them why they're frustrated with the coworker, well, I'm frustrated because the coworker won't cooperate with me. So it's a very, very much a you know, strict causal relationship. A nuanced version of this belief is that emotions are caused by one's evaluations of events and circumstances. So in between 
like events and circumstances and the emotion, there's this idea that the story I'm telling myself is what generates a particular emotion. So, you know, perhaps that, and what's good about this belief is at least it gives you something you can do with your client. If the client believes that their emotions are purely the result of what's happened to them, there's really nothing you can do with them. If they believe that there's something happening in between, then you can have them explore alternate perspectives. And they might look at, you know, are they frustrated because they, uh, um, because they're telling themselves their coworkers should be, cooperate with them. However, um, and, and this basic strategy is popular in emotional intelligence circles. It's generally referred to as reframing. And, um, you know, we're, we think it falls short in that it doesn't typically re result in a full resolution of the presenting emotion. And as we'll explain later, it leaves money on the table. Instead, we believe that emotions are caused by one's evaluations of need fulfillment. So in between something that happens, um, that emotions basically, painful emotions arise when you're not on track to fulfill a need, and pleasurable emotions arise when you are on track to fulfill a need, that emotions are feedback from your subconscious about your own performance. Um, and to kind of tease this out a little bit. So we believe that if you're frustrated, it's always because you have a subconscious assessment that you're not on track to achieve a goal you set for yourself. And the moment you get back on track to achieve that goal, you'll feel satisfied with how things are going. If you're anxious, it's because your subconscious has identified a risk that you are not on track to mitigate. And when you are on track to mitigate that risk, the feedback you'll be getting from your subconscious will be in the form of a sense of confidence. Anger, it always points to uh, a right that you're not on track to assert and you feel empowered when you are. Fear, it relate, points to a need to protect an asset and you feel secure when you're on track to protect that asset. Resentment, you have the assessment that you're not on track to receive some consideration that you're due. And when you do receive it or are on track to receive it, you'll feel appreciative and so on and so on. So we believe this is true for um, that there's some number of needs and that each one generates either a painful emotion or a pleasurable emotion, depending on whether you're on, on track or not to fulfill that need. Um, and as I think you can see as a coach, this is hugely helpful because if you can identify what emotion your client is experiencing, then this mapping points you directly to what need is at play. You can have them then work with that need, get back on track to fulfill the need. And when they do, not only is the painful emotion resolved, but it's resulted in an increase in their performance. The second um, belief that we find really gets in the way of being able to coach a client in emotional intelligence is their beliefs about what caused reactive behavior. There's a very common belief among clients that emotions drive their reactive behavior. If, uh, well, let's say you're coaching a high potential and they're currently um, in trouble, that it looks like they're not going to get promoted because they blew up at one of their subordinates when the subordinates challenged your client uh, uh, a decision that your client had made. And when you ask such clients, hey, what, what, why'd you uh, blow up at this person? Oh, well, I was angry. And if you are living in this paradigm, then as a coach, you would tend to try to train your client in uh, to count to 10 when they get angry or practice mindfulness or something like that. And our experience is this never works quite flawlessly. And the reason it doesn't work is because um, there's uh, evidence from neuro, uh, neuroscience research that the emotion circuit and the behavior circuit are two parallel circuits in the brain. So here, um, which you'll see on your screen in the yellow, which is called the fulfillment monitor, that's what we're referring to as your emotion circuit, and below it in purple is the behavior machine, and that 
when you're in a situation where the stakes are high and you feel threatened, believe you're threatened or something like that, these two circuits operate in parallel with the behavior machine on the bottom um, immediately taking action. And these two boxes that are um, white with blue lettering, assumptions about what's needed and tactics for fulfilling this need, that this is actually the subconscious programming that is driving the person's reactive behavior. Um, so going back to that example where your coaching client may have been challenged, uh, a decision of theirs was challenged, we, we would uh, work with them to say, okay, what, what assumptions do you have that had you feel an, a need, that you believed you had a need to assert your right to make the decision in the situation? You'd examine that. And if, in fact, there's nothing wrong with those assumptions, nothing maladaptive about the assumptions, shift their attention to, okay, what tactics are you going to use going forward when you're in a situation like this? And maybe the tactics that worked well on the high school playground aren't going to work in your corporate environment. And as a coach, work with them to develop a tactics for asserting their right in that situation that uh, are appropriate to the corporate culture. And we find we do this well the next time this person is in this situation, their conditioned behavioral response is an adaptive one and one they don't refer to as a reactive behavior. So our theory is that what really causes reactive behavior is maladaptive assumptions and tactics that uh, uh, may have been ad adaptive in the past, but are no longer appropriate for the situation that the, your client is in. All right, the last one here. Um, how do emotions impact decision-making? The typical client belief is that emotions impair rational decision-making. You should leave your decisions at the door. You should take your, the emotion out of it. Sorry, leave your emotions at the door. Take the emotion out of it. Um, we, we disagree. We believe that, and hopefully you're beginning to see that, that since emotions contain data about your performance and whether you are or are not on track to fulfill your needs, your emotions contain exactly the data you need to make an informed, rational decision. And that it's when you work with your emotions in this way that you end up making very good decisions. If you work against your emotions or completely ignore your emotions, that can lead to suboptimal decisions. For example, here are some uh, three people who are, were well known for being very good decision makers and very high performers. So Thomas Edison, in his process of inventing a light bulb, that uh, a long-lasting light bulb, became exquisitely attuned to his frustration. And whenever his frustration would arise, that would be a signal to him that his subconscious, which processes information much faster than the conscious mind, had concluded that he was no longer on track to fulfill his goal, and he looked for alternate ways, you know, alternate uh, metals etc. to use for the light bulb. Uh, another example, um, if you're familiar with Andy Grove, he was the CEO of Intel during one of the uh, uh, most interesting times in the company history. And um, as the leader of a technology company where a competitor having um, could create a disruptive innovation and that risk was always there, he would bring his management team together and actually cultivate and uh, a sense of anxiety, ferret out any latent anxiety so they could identify the risk to their business and put plans in place to mitigate. And then an example I'm sure you're all familiar with, uh, Mahatma Gandhi, one of our icons of nonviolence, he described himself as an intensely angry man and saw his anger as something that would remind him to whenever he was no longer on track to assert the right of self-determination for the Indian people. So um, to summarize this new theory, uh, uh, this diagram, which we call the adaptive performance system, we're basically saying that there's kind of three, um, three kinds of things that are happening in your mind relative to emotions. One's your behavior machine which is being driven by assumptions about what's needed in a given situation, the tactics for fulfilling those, and then your fulfillment monitor, which is constantly monitoring whether you are or are not on track to 
fulfill the, the needs at play, generating painful emotions when you're off track, pleasurable emotions when it thinks you're on track, and then finally, this top box, the performance tuner, this is um, the only part of the system that is uh, that you're conscious of. It's the only process that's happening at a conscious level of awareness. This is what you might think of as your conscious mind, where we're saying one of its jobs is to pay exquisite attention to the emotions arising from the fulfillment monitor and then um, drilling down to understand what needs are at play and then looking to see what changes in your subconscious programming, be them you know, assumptions about what's needed, the criteria as to what on track looks like that's, and your tactics for fulfilling the need. And that in the process of, of looking at these uh, assumptions, criteria, and tactics, uh, Jim and I have found that you can always find some way of working with the client where modifying one or more of these gets the client back on track to fulfill their need or have them see that maybe this isn't really something they need to do in this moment. So with this, I'm going to turn the presentation over to uh, Jim, who's going to walk you through a client example showing how tenor can be applied in real life. Great. Thank you, Charles. So um, since I spend a lot of time coaching clients and tenor, I like to bring into the picture um, some client experiences and how would you use this with clients. So say you have a coaching client that is ranting and raving um, about a situation they have at work, as you might see here on the slide. Um, I can't believe what an idiot Bob is. He knows every month I need his data by the 25th of the month so I can process it for our month in report. It's not like the 25th changes every month. It's like Christmas. It's the same date every time. I don't know if he's incompetent or malicious or maybe both. I do know it's driving me crazy. We've all had clients that are getting pretty upset and agitated, uh, and it's always someone else's fault. Um, and so how would we apply this new theory of emotion to uh, increasing their emotional intelligence in this situation? So if we look at the next slide. Um, the tenor method um, is a simple way of meeting the client where they are, relieving their distress, but also bringing greater accountability and resourcefulness, which as coaches we, we always want to do, um, as well as, as Charles alluded to earlier, improving their decision-making ability so that they actually can improve their performance over the long run, which is, of course, what, what coaches are aiming to do with almost all their clients. So, um, Let's see, we call it the tenor method because it's a five-step process and tenor is an acronym for the five steps. So I'll walk you through each step. The first step is the T step, which stands for release tensions. And um, what I do in that step is I have the client scan their body and call out each area of tension. Uh, once they find a specific area of tension, say in their jaw, I then have the client tense the muscle in that area while breathing in and then release it as they breathe out. This typically releases the tension, although sometimes I'll have to have them repeat it multiple times. Um, the reason that we start here is with releasing tension and why that's important is because if a client is tense, they're likely cut off from feeling their emotion. And it's obviously gonna be hard to work with emotions if, if the client can't even feel it or identify those emotions. So that's the first step. Then the next step, um, the E step, is stands for naming emotions. Um, we call this name it to tame it because the act of naming the emotion out loud helps shift the perspective of the client on that emotion. In other words, we're shifting them from feeling like they're helplessly possessed by the emotion to instead being a person who is experiencing a certain emotion. Uh, sometimes the client is already aware of an emotion and they can easily express it and name it. Sometimes uh, in the process of releasing tension, they become aware of additional emotions that they may have been suppressing. That's common as well. Um, in the case of this client, they started out with frustration. That was their presenting emotion. Hey, hey Jim, then, you, yeah. your audio has gotten a little muffled. I wish oh, you really? could, if you could move your microphone, I think it's rubbing against your face or something. Let's see. It's, it's your headset that's got a problem. Well, it's actually set to go through my webcam. Maybe the webcam is on your problem. I'm going to switch it to the headset. Okay. 
Um, can you yeah, hear that, me okay? Yeah, that, yeah, that's way better. Thank you. Okay. There may be a problem with the webcam microphone. So um, thanks for letting me know, Terry. Um, so in the process of naming the emotion, the client becomes more composed because instead of being possessed by their emotion, they are basically just acknowledging, I'm a person and I am feeling frustrated. I am feeling resentful. Um, and so the, the result of that successful completion of the E step is that they tend to be a bit more composed. Moving on to the third step, we call this uh, third step, the end step is about owning needs. And this is really a critical juncture because it's very important for me to get the client to realize that the external life condition, in this case Bob, is not the true source of their emotion. Uh, instead, He's frustrated because he's not on track to achieve a particular goal, in this case, to get his month-end report completed on time. Now, probably every coach, any, anyone on this call who's coached someone has had a client come in claiming that they need your help to get, quote-unquote, someone else to change, that those people are the source of the problem, and that if the coach can just get those people to change, then everything will be fine. Of course, those people are not your coaching client and you probably can't change them, uh, even if you wanted to. Um, and so as long as the client is, is blaming those people, you can't do much. There's not much of an opening. Whereas once you get them to own their part in the situation, there are more options. Um, in this case, the option that they have is uh, regarding frustration is to look at their goals. Um, and so what I have them do in that case is I say, okay, if, if you're frustrated, then it's because you're not on track to achieve a goal. Now let's talk about that goal. Um, is your goal clear enough? Because a fuzzy target is hard to hit. Is it achievable? Because obviously an impossible target is even harder to hit. Um, are, they, are they really clear enough about the specifics of their goal? Once they understand, okay, I, it's not about Bob, it's because I have this goal to get this report done and I'm not on track to do that. Bob is circumstantially involved, but Bob is not the source of my emotions. Once they start to do that, they'll start to feel more personally accountable for the situation, which as a coach, I'm sure you recognize once the client feels more personally accountable, they are more empowered in a sense. So at this point, I've got them to recognize that they're owning the need. Then I need to expand their options for meeting that need. And that brings us to the next step which is the O step, which is about generate options. And this is where the magic really starts to happen with the client. You may recall from the adaptive performance system model that there are three knobs. Uh, if you go to the next slide, there are three knobs that you can turn, the A, C, and T knobs. We call it ACT. Um, and that stands for, the A stands for uh, assumptions. Next slide. A stands for assumptions about the situation about what activates the need. Um, and so I remind the client that, you know, what are the assumptions that you're making? You must be making some assumptions in the situation. And I challenge their assumptions to the extent that that's possible. So um, for example, in this case with this client, are you assuming that Bob is the only source of that data? Are there potentially other sources, maybe less convenient, but you know, are there any other sources? Um, are you assuming that your boss is always going to blame you for the report being late? Or does your boss know about what's going on with Bob or, or about the extenuating circumstances? These are examples of assumptions. And with more time, we could probably identify even more assumptions that, that the client is making about the report and about Bob. And then moving on to the next uh, slide, the C steps for criteria. Criteria is about how do I know what on track looks like? So I asked the client, how do you know that you're on track or you're not on track? And he might say, well, if I get Bob's input by the 25th, then I'll be on track. Um, and then I might get him to reconsider those criteria and say, is that really the best criteria or is there something else? Or what changes could you make to, those, to that criteria? For example, uh, if you, can you change your process of, of processing the data from Bob so that you could get it by the 27th and still hit your target? Or can you tell Bob that the deadline is now the 23rd? Um, can you, can you rene renegotiate the due date for the report with your boss? These are examples of, of tweaks that could be made to the criteria. Moving on to the next, 
we uh, the, the third letter is T, which stands for tactics. And, and tactics will be pretty familiar because most managers and particularly project managers, they're really great at tactics. They can come up with plan A, plan B, plan C. They're really great at coming up with a lot of different tactics. Um, and so just walking them through what tactics are, are available uh, and getting them to brainstorm, that's probably the easiest part because, you know, you can say, okay, have you, have you had your boss talk to Bob's boss? Uh, to put pressure on Bob, or can you talk to IT to get a different, an alternative source of data? These are all examples of tactics. Now, the thing that to mention is that while the tactics are the most obvious step that people, you know, especially managers and organizations uh, readily take to, the A, the assumptions and criteria can actually be even more powerful because the uh, tactics are what's obvious. It's the part of the iceberg above the, the waterline. The criteria that they're using and the assumptions are below the waterline. So the client may be less familiar with it or maybe less aware of it. And some people don't like to introspect and, and reflect on their assumptions, but they're actually more powerful. And let me explain why. Uh, to, to implement tactics changes, the client actually has to do stuff. They have to get other people involved. They have to get other people to cooperate. Whereas when you make an assumption change or a criteria change, that may be a, a mental model shift that happens instantly. As soon as the person realizes that the, the error of it or that it's not serving them, they could shift that belief potentially uh, nearly immediately. And then everything looks differently. Um, it also opens up additional tactic options, uh, typically. So that's why even though it's a little bit of work to get clients to look at the assumptions and criteria, um, it's a great uh, role for the coach to actually help the client do that. Okay. All right. So um, let's assume then that the client has generated a bunch of options by looking at their assumptions, criteria, and tactics. And of those multiple options, they are starting to feel like some of these options are potential winners, that these options really could do something. The client shifts from feeling powerless and like a victim to being much more resourceful because they have options. They may not like all their options, but they at least have options. And that's when we start to see the client start to feel uh, excited and resourceful. Now, at this point, often the client wants to just run out and start implementing it. And the coach has to say, whoa, don't do that. Hang on, there's one more step. And that's the R step, which is to gut check your resolutions. In other words, to check in with your subconscious to make sure that your subconscious is on board with the planned options. The reason this is important is let's remember it was your subconscious that sounded the alarm in the first place that there was a problem in the form of generating a painful emotion. And so since it was your subconscious that was most kind of wise in seeking that, it's, it's important to seek its counsel to make sure that the uh, option that's being considered for implementation is actually going to do the job and address the need, uh, address the, uh, the situation where you're not on track to meet a need. So that's why it's important. Again, like I said, the client usually wants to just run off and implement it because they're excited about the options that we've come up with. But we have to kind of say, okay, wait a second. Can you just take a few minutes, review the plan of action, and just sit quietly and just notice, are you feeling any, any discomfort? Uh, how's your gut feeling? Are you feeling what we call a, a little niggle, a little tickle in the back of your head that's saying, you know, I'm not so sure about this. Are there any gotchas or ways that this could backfire or any unforeseen considerations or, or impacts of what you're planning. Um, and sometimes a client needs more than just a few minutes. They need to sleep on it or take more extensive actions to really deeply listen to their subconscious. Um, I had one client who would take a long shower to listen to his subconscious. Another would take a walk in the woods. Um, and, and, and when I did this with this particular client, they discovered a niggle about one aspect of the plan. Uh, the client the client's subconscious basically reminded him that he had previously been criticized by his boss for bringing things to the boss's attention without having done his own due diligence, without having exhausted all of the options that did not involve the boss. And so the client decided, okay, I'm going to do this in two phases. Phase one is I'm going to take, do all the actions I can take on my own. And then only if those fail, would I move on to phase two and involve the boss and ask the boss for help. Once the client had kind of cleared that niggle and realized, okay, now I understand. I had them check in again, and he said, yeah, I'm clean now. It, you know, this is a clean slate. I, I feel comfortable with this option. I'm not noticing any discomfort from my subconscious. And he moved forward to implement it. So when a client appears reluctant or hesitant or is procrastinating, 
um, rather than assume it's due to some laziness or some, you know, character defect, um, I typically assume that it's due to some kind of subconscious uh, niggle or some kind of subconscious uh, uh, reluctance uh, about the plan that's being considered. And that once we pause, explore that, and resolve that, that discomfort, the client will be much more committed to their course of action. All right. Um, next slide. So um, that's, the that's the five steps of tenor. And I want to talk now about how we've seen clients benefit from tenor. Um, and uh, first of all, the most obvious is performance improvement. Because our emotions contain data about our performance, ways in which we are or are not on track to meet a need, the immediate benefit of tenor is that the performance improves because we're listening to, to all the signals. Um, it's kind of like if our car was not operating successfully and we bothered to take note of the dashboard lights that were telling us the check engine light, uh, we call our mechanic and the mechanic addresses the problem, suddenly our car is working better. So performance improvement is, is the, 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 the first and most obvious. The second is stress reduction. So uh, stress, in our view, is caused when we tolerate tension, reactivity, negativity, powerlessness, and reluctance. And those are the signs of not, as you may recall, of not working with our emotions. And that when we start to listen to our emotions, that we have less of that tension, reactivity, negativity, powerlessness, and reluctance. Now, I should mention that there are many forms of stress and sources of stress. There's environmental stress. There's, there's biological stress. Uh, and so this, uh, we're not saying that tenor will address all forms of stress from all causes. But if the stress is because the person is not uh, listening to their emotions and they start listening to them, then this tenor will help with that part of it. Okay. The next thing that uh, tenor helps with is employee engagement. Um, if you think about a time when you were, um, you know, tense, reactive, negative, powerless, or reluctant, how engaged were you? Um, uh, and, and those things get in the way of engagement. When someone's feeling grounded, composed, accountable, resourceful, and committed, they are almost by definition more engaged. And so to the extent that Tenor helps bring those five qualities forward, it will help with employee engagement. Now, there's other f uh, problems uh, in a workplace that cause employees to not be engaged, bad management, uh, structural problems, uh, poor pay and benefits, and, and so forth. But tenor won't help with any of those, obviously. But to the extent that someone is experiencing a lot of emotions and they are not able to address those emotions in a satisfactory way, that's going to lead to disengagement, and tenor will help with engagement. Another way that tenor can help is with rational decision making. Charles mentioned this at the beginning of our talk. Um, and it's common for people in business to believe that emotions get in the way of rational decision making. And as Charles mentioned earlier, we believe that when people are working with their emotions, listening carefully to the data it contains, that that actually improves decision making. The next area that uh, tenor helps is with leadership development. Now, this may not be an obvious uh, uh, impact of, of tenor because you think it's about emotions, but really being attuned to your own needs and creating strategies for fulfilling your needs, that's the essence of personal leadership or what Stephen Covey would call a personal leadership. Likewise, when you turn your focus on not your inner needs, but on outward towards other people's needs, and you are able to sense the needs of stakeholders based on the emotions that you're picking up, okay, this stakeholder group is fearful. They, they are worried about protecting an asset. This other stakeholder group is anxious. They are concerned about mitigating a risk. When you start to actually be able to decode the emotion and turn it into understanding the underlying needs, that's information you can, a leader can really use to help manage and work better with that group of stakeholders. And that leads into change management, um, because to the extent that a leader can anticipate resistance, can re anticipate anxiety, anger, fear, they can actually more accurately uh, prevent or proactively respond to that, meaning instead of waiting for the employees to get angry, address concerns that employees have about uh, protecting assets. Instead of waiting for employees to storm their office with anxiety, figure out how you can proactively communicate about how we're going to mitigate risk. 
This is coming up a lot with uh, the coronavirus uh, crisis. I'm advising a lot of executives to talk about the risks and what you're doing to mitigate those risks and proactively communicate that with employees to reduce anxiety. So these are all ways that clients have benefited from Tenor that we've witnessed in the workplace with actual clients. So uh, I'm mentioning clients, and I just want to mention briefly, if we go to the next slide, uh, some ways that we've heard from clients. Now, we've got a lot of quotations from a lot of clients, and these are just a few of the br more brief ones. Um, but I, while, while you're taking a look at what's on this slide, um, and these are real quotes from real clients, um, I want to bring Terry uh, or invite Terry to talk because besides Charles and I, Terry has had uh, some of the most experience uh, coaching real clients with Tenor. So, Terry, can you briefly just mention, you know, what are some of your experiences working with clients with Tenor? Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> so, Tenor, I think, is one of the most, one of the biggest breakthroughs around emotional uh, management and performance improvement that I've seen in years. And uh, when I first um, experienced the training <clears throat> in Boulder, Colorado with with Charles and Jim, uh, I immediately got excited and started using it with clients right away. Uh, and since I've developed a partnership with, with Jim and Charles and, and supporting their efforts to, to get this information more broadly distributed. Uh, but I'll just give you one quick uh, example. Uh, I know Jim shared one. I'd like to share my own example. I had a client who came um, to me uh, who I've been worked with for years, <clears throat> and she was completely distraught, um, literally crying uh, at my uh, coaching uh, session. And I immediately went to Tenor to explain to her, hey, would you like to experiment with a new method to uh, be able to handle some of uh, the stress that you're feeling right now? So we uh, went through the, the, the five steps, uh, starting with uh, getting her grounded where she could um, – you know, be able to fully experience the emotion. And one of the things about tenor is, is you don't want to tamper down the emotions. Sometimes you actually want to accentuate them. And uh, this can be a, an interesting challenge for some coaches who get uh, shy away from heavy emotion. Uh, so this is, uh, can give you confidence actually as a coach to fully embrace emotion. So I told her, okay, we want you to really feel into exactly what's going on for you here. Instead of trying to give her a tissue and help her calm down, I said, tell me exactly how you're feeling. What is coming up for you right now? And we listed every single emotion. And there were actually 10. I'd never had this much emotion <clears throat> in one session. So we began to just, I said, well, let's start with one at a time and unravel what's really happening here. And... Uh, <clears throat> She began to share, well, I'm angry because so this isn't happening. I said, well, you know, well, what do you think you need to tell that person? T tell me more about what's not being said. Uh, and, you know, and we went through the, the next one, which is frustration. I said, well, what goal are you not here? Uh, what, do you, what goal are you not on track to achieve? She talked about anxiety. I said, well, what risks do you think are here that, that you need to manage? And literally within 30 minutes, we went through all 10 of them. And she had completely, and this doesn't always happen this fast, but she was very open, uh, and we had a lot of trust, where she could fully explore all of this. And in 30 minutes, she had completely turned her entire, um, you know, aff affect around. She was no longer overwhelmed and crying. She was feeling confident that this isn't that big a deal. I can address all of these. You know, it was just overwhelmed with the number of emotions that she was dealing with at once. And how many of us get overwhelmed when we uh, have a lot of things hitting us at one time? Well, Tenor can help you really unravel all of that, rationalize it, make it have more, make more sense, and then empower uh, your client or yourself. You can use Tenor on yourself too to really see new options and to realize that, hey, I, I got this. This is not not as big a deal as I thought. I'm no longer overwhelmed. I've got a plan. I've got these ten action items that are going to take us forward. Uh, so I've really seen uh, Tenor change things dramatically, uh, and, and I think there's some key assumptions that we have in current beliefs about emotions that this, this method and this theory that, that Charles went over kind of uh, sheds new light, gives us new perspectives uh, to be able to use emotions as a, what I call a, a source of wisdom. Emotions, emotions are wisdom from our subconscious that enable us to come up with new creative solutions as opposed to something to avoid or run away from or, or try and, uh, you know, uh, wish away or meditate away. Instead, you need to really embrace them.
So that's just a, a quick example for me and, and one of the reasons I'm so excited about this tool. That's great, Terry. Thank you. Um, you just mentioned meditation and uh, Charles earlier mentioned mindfulness. And I, I want to proactively address a potential misunderstanding because I'll, I'll speak. I, I've been a mindfulness practitioner for 30 years. So uh, nothing about what Terry, Charles and I have said should be interpreted as saying that we think that mindfulness is a bad idea. Um, but we do think that it, it can be misused to cover up an emotion, to suppress an emotion. And the analogy I would use with a client is, you know, there's nothing wrong with aspirin. Um, but if you're taking fistfuls of aspirin because you have this headache that won't go away and what you actually have is a brain tumor, the aspirin is actually a bad idea because it's keeping you from getting, going to the doctor to get treatment for the brain tumor. Likewise, if someone uses mindfulness to smother the emotion or to suppress it or to distract themselves from the emotion, this very lovely tool of mindfulness, which I very much agree with, is actually being misused. What's needed instead is to focus on the emotion, go into it, and really understand it. And sometimes mindfulness can help someone do that, um, but often people use mindfulness to kind of avoid something that's uncomfortable. Yeah, so would, in true I mindfulness, would, you dive in. Go ahead. Yeah, I want to just uh, assert uh, what Jim is saying is that uh, mindfulness is part of this technique, actually, being mindful of what you're feeling, right, and mm -hmm. mindful of your uh, assumptions. So, so it, mindfulness actually helps with this technique. Absolutely. Um, but, but I think sometimes people try and just um, – essentially do step one, which is to relieve the tension, and then they quit, <laughs> right? Which we know this is going to come up again. Uh, they don't go away, right? Because that, that, that would actually hurt your performance if, if you weren't paying attention to these emotions. Yep, excellent. So um, do you want to lead us through the Q&A? Yeah, like absolutely. So we have, Ed, uh, Pat, would you like to unmute yourself and come online and ask your question? Yes. Can you hear me all right? Yes. Yep. And, and if you want, you can turn your video on. It's optional, but. All right. I don't know how good it'll be, but. Yeah, there you are. I see you. Yeah, I, I'm, uh, you know, from Susan David's book, Emotional Agility, and on and on and on. There's a lot that has come about in the last four or five years I'm writing about it these days. And in the mm -hmm. early days of coaching, we were, oh, if a, if a client gets emotional, be careful. Mm -hmm. They might need to see a therapist. And now what I love about you guys' work is emotional intelligence is only good if we use it. <laughs> so my question was, how does this help coaches? Um, what's the word? Um, navigate emotions in a coaching relationship so that it doesn't become personal archaeology like psychotherapy. I think part of, uh, I think, and I think Charles will have some thoughts on that too, but what I would say is that uh, what keeps it in the realm of, of coaching as opposed to therapy is that we're not trying to understand why you have certain beliefs uh, or why you're making these certain assumptions, that you're making a, a negative assumption about uh, uh, women in authority because your mother was uh, do domineering. I mean, we're not going into any of that. We don't really care why you have that assumption. Uh, but we, we just want to surface it and have you look at it and decide, is that serving you? Uh, and if not, let's change it. Um, but we're not really going into the why you're, you're having these assumptions, criteria, and tactics, more just uh, dealing with it in the present. Yeah. Charles, do so, you have anything to add? I'll give a quick example. I, I just smile every time I think about it. I was um, working with a, a middle-aged woman and um, – presented this theory and we focused specifically on anger and she's she said oh, I am just angry with my husband all the time and I'm like okay um, why don't you f try to frame that in terms of I'm angry with my husband because I believe I have a right to blank and I'm not on track to assert that right and so I could see the wheels turning in her head and suddenly there's that aha that moment and then immediately her cheeks get flushed and she's terribly embarrassed. I said, what'd you find? And she said, and I, I love that she answered it this way. She said, my subconscious has, the, uh, has an assumption that I have a right to expect my husband to know what I want and give it to me before I ask him for it. <laughs> and, and then of course, you know, it's like, well, how, how's that working out for you? Not very well, but it worked out great for my mom. 
like, you know, mom and dad both bought into that. It worked fine for them. So, um, you know, in my experience, you're, you're never going to get into the sort of psychological story that's uh, uh, behind the whole thing. You really just laser in on those assumptions, criteria, and tactics, and it keeps it as part of a coaching conversation. One limitation of tenor, I would say, is uh, most clients, you can kind of show them, most clients, there's kind of an 80-20 rule where if you show them how to interpret two or three emotions, that's like 80% of the benefit. They typically will be certain ones they just struggle with. And um, uh, I have had a couple clients where I can explain to them that say it's um, protecting an asset behind their fear, but yet they're unable to make the behavior change. They're unable to change their subconscious programming. And it's because they have unhealed trauma around that emotion and need. And tenor is great for identifying where you have un, uh, underlying trauma and great for integrating that piece back into yourself after you have it healed. But tenor is not, uh, uh, it's out of scope to use tenor to he try to heal trauma. So thank you so much, uh, uh, Pat, for coming on and asking your question. Um, Carolyn Meyer, uh, would you like to ask, you have a couple questions that you've typed in. Would you like to unmute yourself and join the conversation? Sure. Um, I, I wanted to ask, how do you deal with the, the notion that when we are angry and stressed, we, our intelligence is lower? I mean, I've, I guess, I don't know if it's the zeitgeist or I haven't read any neuroscience documentation on it, but I feel like I hear that. And then my second question, and how to, uh, basically, how does the can, model... Can we take that? them one at a time? Yeah, yeah of course. Go ahead. Sure. Yeah, yeah just uh, I think it, it gets a little over when we're juggling multiple ones. So for that first one, I've got a thought. Um, I make a distinction with my coaching clients between a loss of composure and having a strong emotion. And most people don't make that distinction because they, they, they witness it as occurring simultaneously. But... The biological loss of composure, which is the, you know, the raised blood pressure, what's sometimes called an amygdala reaction, uh, the, the generation of certain hormones and cortisol and so forth, that's a, a physical biological phenomenon, um, evolutionarily determined uh, you know, response to threat. Um, that all is happening in parallel. Um, and, and, and when you are completely out of composure, it's hard to do any cognitive process. Tenor is a cognitive process. Um, things that people learn in therapy or, or, or coaching, those are cognitive processes. So I always tell clients, you've got to regain a certain amount of composure. Um, so I teach them simple techniques, you know, counting to 10, get, getting up and getting a drink of water, you know, more sophisticated techniques. But once they regain composure, um, and then they can actually look at their emotion and use tenor to process it. But I, I, I really separate those two. And you're right. Uh, loss of composure does seem to make us less intelligent uh, in a sense because we are less cognitively capable in that mode. Um, but then once they regain cognitive composure, you know, five minutes later, they ha are now composed, but they're still angry. Um, and then I say, okay, now let's process your anger. Okay. Does, that, does that make sense? Yes, very much so. And then um, second, hey, and, and I would go ahead. Charles. I would just add to that, Caroline, that um, there's uh, there's some good research by Matthew Lieberman showing that the moment someone names the emotion that they're experiencing, be it anger, or fear, or anxiety, they actually regain their composure. They're still angry, but they they regain their composure. We believe because their conscious mind and subconscious mind are now on the same page. The subconscious has succeeded in delivering its distress call to the conscious mind or the performance monitor in this diagram. And the conscious mind um, you know, has basically said, hey, I've got this. And then the subconscious can relax. The, you know, the, the, the guy upstairs, the one with the critical thinking skills is, is able to intervene here. But until the subconscious knows that the conscious mind is on, is on it, has, has caught it, so to speak, it's just going to enact whatever behavioral strategy it has from its past, and those are usually not pretty. 
So you are, you're basically impaired only for a short time. Most of the time you're not, the amygdala is not, you know, doing the uh, frustrated, angry. That's, that's the minority of the time, I assume, right? So most of the time you're in a, a state where you could name the emotion. Or I, I imagine most people aren't just running around with rage, maybe driving sometimes, but <laughs> you know uh, if that's My, the my experience has been the, the, the moment you can get the client to say, I'm angry, I'm really, really angry, they're already in a much better shape. And Charles, I would agree with that. I think, <clears throat> you know, the T, going back to the T, T is also a way to, to bring, you know, the, the parasympathetic nervous system back into a, a state of, of more cognitive awareness. And what I mean by that is just taking a few deep breaths and then be getting them to name the emotions very quickly after that. Uh, like in the example I shared earlier, uh, it, it is empowering for people to actually name their emotions, to acknowledge them, and, and to feel heard, right? As you as a coach are, are bearing witness to the importance of these emotions and acknowledging their role uh, in, in actually managing performance. So, so it's, it's, it's incredibly empowering uh, environment and people begin to calm down uh, quite quickly. They still have this underlying anger. It's not resolved until you come up with new options. Um, but but it, it, it helps you immediately. So Carolyn, I think you had a second question. Carol, Carolyn? Uh, uh, yes, yes. Could this approach be used for someone who's unapproachable? I mean, I'm sure we've all worked in those environments and you just let the person, they may not be approachable for a day. And, and is that because they're not thinking about this and addressing, I mean, they, they arguably they're, in, they're sick or they're not having a good day, they're not feeling well, they may have neck pain. How, how, you can't really resolve that biological hurdle, sure. but how, how would you address that? Yeah, that yeah if someone is, is experiencing, um, you know, they're, they're, they're reactive um, or irritable simply because of physical illness or exhaustion, um, you know, their cognitive abilities are impaired. Um, and so working with them if, using any cognitive technique is going to be difficult. Um, and so, you know, typically waiting until they are in a better cognitive uh, form is better. Um, but you're, you're actually talking about something that, that we call tenor with others, um, which is because so far we've been talking about using tenor on ourselves or helping a client use it on themselves. Tenor with others is where you know just because of an emotion you're seeing what, a, what need that client, that, that person is not on track to fulfill. So if someone's sick or tired or, or physically impaired, that, that's not the, the, the best use of tenor. I would say if, if the next day they're still angry, then you can talk about, okay, well, what, are, what uh, right are you having trouble asserting here? What right do you feel is being violated in the situation? And they might look surprised, like, how did you know that, that that's what I'm upset about? Well, once you know tenor, you, you have kind of a little mini superpower in that you know what needs someone's not on track to fulfill simply because you, you can see the emotion that they're exhibiting. So I've had people act surprised when I, when I use tenor on them in that way because they, they kind of like don't know how I figured out what need they weren't on track to fulfill. So that's how I would answer that. Do you other, uh, Charles or, or Terry, anything to add? Well, I want to just say this is an a amazing tool for to use with a spouse or a significant other because, you know, <laughs> when they are upset, whatever that is, anxious, nervous, angry, um, you know, uh, whatever the emotion is, you, you can facilitate uh, helping them work through it by saying, okay, you know, what goal are you wanting to achieve here that's not happening if you're frustrated or, or tell me what risks you're, you're uh, not managing at the moment. That you and think Charles we, and I would agree with that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it it can be used that that's a one very practical way to use tenor with others, but it can be used with your employees too. You know, when you hear and see frustration or anxiety, start asking them questions, and that can help them process it and give you greater wisdom about what's happening in the environment as well. Charles, I'm wondering if you could advance to the uh, the final slide. I noticed we've only got a couple minutes left, so um, 
uh, and if, if others have questions, my email address is right here. Um, and if you want a copy of the slides, you can email me directly or Terry tells me that um, he can post the slides. So I'll, I'll create a, a summary version of the slides, a PDF, and send that to him and he'll upload it to the, the fielding um, uh, Base SharePoint. Camp. Mm -hmm. Base camp, sorry. Yeah. Um, other things you can do, uh, visit tenormethod.com. And at tenormethod.com, you'll find uh, some other ways to read about Tenor, some more information. You can also sign up uh, to review our upcoming book. We're just about finished with that. Um, and uh, you can also sign up to receive mon monthly email with Tenor tips. And you can also buy a Tenor coaching session if you want to be coached on Tenor yourself. Um, and... Uh, also, you can uh, read the, uh, besides the book, we also have a chapter in a monograph that Terry is editing. Um, Terry, do you want to briefly mention that? Uh, yeah, absolutely. That's coming out? So we just submitted the manuscript uh, for our upcoming coaching monograph. And monograph is a fancy name for a single topic that with research and practice. So Fielding uh, publishes monographs in our Fielding Graduate University Press. And the new monograph is being uh, titled uh, Innovations in Coaching Research and Practice. And uh, we have a total of 19 chapters. And uh, Jim and Charles have graciously written one of the chapters. So uh, that'll be another opportunity uh, to, to learn more uh, when the monograph comes out, probably in uh, June or early July. So uh, stay tuned for that. You'll hear a lot more yeah. about the monograph. Yeah, because uh, the, the monograph is a scholarly work, uh, you know, it has a lot more theory and citations and references of that sort. The book is aimed at more of a business audience, so it's a little bit lighter on that and it's more focused on, on practice, whereas the monograph has both theory and practice. Absolutely. Well, thank you both, Jim, Charles. It was uh, great having you. And uh, we will be posting this video online. So if any of you uh, came uh, halfway through or would like to you know, have this available to any of your colleagues or friends or family, you will be able to uh, uh, watch it on our YouTube channel. And, and I just also want to invite all of you to uh, join our coaching community of practice. The coaching community of practice is available to anyone in the world who has an interest in learning more about research and practice in uh, coaching. Um, you can go to ccop.fielding.edu, again, ccop.fielding.edu, and then at the bottom of this page, you can click on subscribe. Um, we also have uh, many more upcoming webinars that we invite you to attend. Uh, today, obviously, was on tenor. Our next one will be on Book Yourself Solid, Getting Clients, Even If You Hate Marketing and Selling. So this is what we call our professional series webinar. Less about theory, more about uh, practical business building. Uh, so we're really excited to have Jeff Moore talking about the Book Yourself Solid system. I'm actually certified in that tool and have used that to build the coaching program at Fielding. So uh, what you've been experiencing if you're involved in Fielding is the Book Yourself Solid system. Um, after that, we also have a, another webinar coming up um, on April 18th, which is uh, LinkedIn 2020, what you need to know for your brand, business, and your network. Uh, so we invite you to learn more about marketing through the LinkedIn. Uh, we, May 13th, uh, we'll be talking about coaching clients on non-financial adjustments in retirement transition. So if any of you are getting close to retirement or would like to specialize in the niche of coaching folks nearing retirement, uh, we'll hear the research uh, from one of our uh, fielding PhD graduates, Pauline Johnson Zalonka. Uh, she uh, will be talking about her research and how to you know, apply what she's learned in the coaching arena. So highly recommend that as well. Also, uh, we're very excited uh, to have uh, <clears throat> Brian Underhill, who is the uh, CEO and founder of Coach Source. Coach Source is the global largest uh, network of executive coaches in the world. Uh, he'll be sharing his research uh, on uh, coaching, executive coaching trends, what you need to know. So Brian is certainly a thought leader in the industry. I highly recommend you tune in. Uh, he's graciously coming to share his research and, uh, and what they've learned. I actually am a coach source co coach myself and uh, really enjoy uh, hearing Brian. Uh, and I think uh, if you want to know anything about executive coaching, including pricing, he has a lot of pricing 
research, uh, definitely tune into that as well. So uh, and then you'll uh, be able to hear a lot more um, uh, in upcoming webinars, but that's just a start. Uh, lastly, if you're interested in coach training, you can always go to coach.fielding.edu. Again, coach.fielding.edu and learn about anything uh, coaching at Fielding, uh, including our doctoral specialization in coaching and our certificate program, to, which allows you to get your ICF certification. Uh, you can also watch any of our previously recorded videos, including this one, uh, by going to Thought Leaders uh, series videos or the professional series videos, which are more about business building and applying coaching in the real world. So thank you all for coming. And I also want to especially uh, thank uh, our guests today, uh, Dr. Jim Nuckerbacher and Charles Jones, uh, friends of mine and uh, colleagues, and to share your thought leadership and, and practice in changing the world and using emotions for performance. So thank you all. Thank you, Terry. Thank you, Terry. Take care, everyone. Thanks, Hopefully everyone, we'll see for you your again interest soon. and attention. Bye for now.